Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking Donate. I do this podcast and From John to Justin, which comes out every Friday, and it's a lot of work. I do the writing, the research, everything. I also make YouTube videos about Canadian history and Canadian historical sites. So every dollar you give helps keep it all going. It's my full-time job, and I truly appreciate all the support that you guys provide. As well, if you do become a patron of the $10 and more level, when my new series comes out in December, you get all nine episodes up front right away. You don't have to go week by week, and I can tell you that this series is going to be a good one. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. When we look at the Northwest Resistance of 1885, most of the focus is on Louis Riel. He is the one who was tried for treason and hanged in Regina. He is the one seen as the leader of the Métis, and the man who fought for their rights and to preserve their culture as Canada began to encroach on their lands. There was another man, though, who led the Métis and today remains a folk hero. He fought for the Métis' rights and to preserve their culture just as Louis Riel did. His name was Gabriel Dumont and today I am looking at his life and legacy. The world that Gabriel Dumas was born into was one that was going through an immense change. At his birth, Confederation was only 30 years away and the prairies were opening up to settlers, something that would progress at a faster pace once the Transcontinental Railway came through in the 1880s. For his people, the Métis, there was a huge change in the lifestyle coming. Known for their immense bison hunts, the animals were going to be gone from the prairies within decades due to overhunting by Canadians and Americans. This was the world that Dumas would grow up in and help to shape. Gabriel Dumas was born in December of 1837 in the Red River settlement of future Manitoba. His father, Isidore Dumas, was the grandson of Jean-Baptiste Dumas, a French-Canadian voyageur. The Dumas were well known in the area for their bison hunting abilities, and the family would also make an income selling hides to the Hudson's Bay Company and trading pemmican, the vital resource for fur traders. Dumas would be introduced to bison hunting at an early age, and he quickly proved himself to be skilled in the hunt and as a master of prairie life skills. An excellent marksman with both a rifle and bow, he was also skilled on a horse and knew the land better than most people. He would break his first horse at 10 and quickly master canoeing on the most dangerous white waters. Many would say that he could find his way across the prairies blindfolded. By age 20, Dumas could apparently shoot a duck through the head at 100 paces. On top of all that, he would learn to speak seven languages, including Cree, Blackfoot, Crow, and French, although he only ever learned a few words of English. In the 1840s, Dumas moved with his family to Fort Pitt, remaining until 1848 when they moved back to the Red River area. In 1851, Dumas would fight in the Battle of Grand Coteau when a Dakota war party attacked a Métis encampment. Just over a decade later, in 1862, he traveled with his father to conclude a treaty between the Dakota and the Métis. During this same time in 1858, he married Madeleine Welke, a Métis woman who had accompanied Dumas on his travels as a trader. That year was also the same year his own mother would unfortunately pass away. The stature of Dumas would continue to rise in 1863 when he was named the Hunt Chief of the Saskatchewan Métis due to his skills. Effectively, he would be the last of the Hunt Chiefs as by 1881 the bison herds had mostly disappeared from the land. And during these hunts he used his famed rifle that would become part of his legend, Le Petit. When the Red River Resistance occurred in 1869, Dumas did offer to help at Fort Garry to resist the Wolseley expedition that was coming to put the resistance down. The offer was turned down and Dumas would spend the next decade farming and operating a ferry on the South Saskatchewan River in future Saskatchewan. By the early 1870s, Dumas was seeing that change was coming to the prairies. The bison were gone and the prairies were opening up to agriculture. 
British Columbia had been promised a railroad, and that would go straight through the prairies and bring with it settlers. To that end, on December 10, 1873, Dumont called a meeting to form a new government for the Métis settlement of St. Laurent, which was along the South Saskatchewan River. Chosen as the president of the council, Dumont and the government installed a Métis system of landholding and created a new legal code. A constitution was even created by Dumont for the new government, and the council also stated its loyalty to Canada and promised to disband as soon as a territorial government was created. The year the council was created, Dumont had built his first log cabin in the area and began to state that his profession was that of a farmer. Almost as soon as the council was created, the Canadian government began to state that it was the sole governing authority for the region. Dumont would respond that he was simply forming a local government, not trying to form an independent nation. And for the most part, the government accepted this. In fact, the British Secretary of the Colonies, upon learning about the Council of St. Laurent, stated, quote, it would be difficult to take strong exception to the acts of community which appears to have honesty endeavor to maintain order by the best means in its power. End quote. By early 1875, the council government imposed fines on several Métis who violated the rules of the bison hunt. Those Métis then complained to Lawrence Clark, the factor at Fort Carlton, who then wrote to Lieutenant Governor Alexander Morris, stating the Métis were trying to establish a provisional government and revolt against Canadian authority. The Northwest Mounted Police were dispatched to investigate, but found the charges were without foundation. While Dumont was not attempting to form a separate country, he was not going to allow the territory of the council to be relinquished to the Canadian government. The Canadian government would not accept any thought of the Métis being a self-governing people, and they started to send surveyors into the St. Laurent land, refusing to respect the land tenure system of the Métis. Dumont would attempt to work with the Canadian government, sending several petitions to Ottawa by the 1880s, asking that Parliament recognize the Métis landholdings. At no point did the Canadian government respond, and Dumont decided that the Métis had to protect their land. In March of 1884, Dumont and several of his councillors decided to approach a man who had become an icon to the Métis, Louis Riel. Dumont would convince Riel to come to Saint Laurent, and the two men would form a close friendship as they worked together to protect Métis land claims. By the time March 1885 rolled around, the Métis had received no answer from the Dominion government. A meeting of the Métis was called at Batoche, and several suggested defending their land by taking up arms. Dumont stated that he would lead the defense of Saint Laurent. The decision was made to form the Provisional Government of Saskatchewan in order to negotiate with the Canadian government. About 300 Métis soldiers were organized into a unit, and Dumont was chosen to lead the unit. One reason that Riel tends to be the one focused on what followed was because he was the president of the provisional government, but it should be noted that Dumont was the leader of the community and made many of the political and military decisions. Dumont would relate that Riel said at the time, quote, It has been 15 years since I gave my heart to my country. I am ready to give it again now. End quote. As a young man, I remember playing the first Civilization game on my Tandy 1000 using a five and a quarter floppy disk. From that moment on, I was in love with that series and a fan of the political strategy game that required you to manage a country or a civilization. Games have evolved a lot since then, and today you can play a game like Politics and War, which gives you the political strategy, but adds an online component to it as well. This game allows you to create your own country and compete with thousands of other players diplomatically, militarily, and economically. You can form alliances, harvest and trade resources, and wage wars against other players to compete for influence and political power. The best part is, politics and war is free to play with limited microtransactions to ensure the game is fair and not pay to win. You can play for free in your browser at politicsandwar.com or download it directly from the app and Google Store. I'll also have a link directly to the website in my show notes. Did you know that stress can cause severe hair loss? With so much going on right now, Americans and Canadians are suffering from stress more than ever before. From dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, politics, the economy, 84% of adults have reported feeling stress, which is causing people of all ages and backgrounds to experience some form of hair loss. That's why this show is sponsored by DS Laboratories, a leading company in hair loss, which has formulated a nutritional supplement 
that specifically targets hair loss and thinning hair due to stress. Revita SOD antioxidant tablets are formulated with all the body's necessary nutrients and ingredients required to sustain a healthy head of hair as well as to provide support for your skin and nails. Formulated with premium ingredients which are clinically proven to combat stress-induced hair loss. The best part is you only need to take one tablet per day to see results in as little as 90 days, unlike other supplement brands that make you take up to four a day. Not a supplement person? No problem. They have a complete line of hair care products from shampoos and conditioners to hair serums that are recommended by top dermatologists around the world and have over 10,000 positive reviews. These products help anyone that suffers with any type of hair loss, whether it's genetic, hormonal, dietary, or others. Put the stress behind you and start looking forward to your best hair days. Visit dslaboratories.com right now by clicking the link in my show notes. Amid rumors of a possible Métis attack at Fort Carlton, the Northwest Mounted Police were dispatched to put down the new Métis government. At Duck Lake on March 26, 1885, the Métis and the Northwest Mounted Police met. These two sides would speak, but this fell apart when the Northwest Mounted Police shot and killed an unarmed Cree man and Isidore Dumas, the brother of Gabriel. The Métis quickly returned fire and killed three Mounties and nine militiamen. The Métis stated they fired in self-defense because the Mounties fired first. And in the brief battle, Dumas was shot in the head, but amazingly, survived. The bullet glanced off his skull and he would recover from the injury while still leading his soldiers. He would write, years later, quote, There was a cut two inches long and three quarters of an inch deep, right on the top of my head. I suffered through the whole war from Fish Creek to Batosh, shouting in pain all day long. My head bled all night. End quote. Roger Goulet, a government commissioner, would say of seeing Dumas weeks later, quote, When Gabriel came before me after the rebellion to make an affidavit, he had to remove his hat, and I saw the furrow that had been plowed along the top of his head. He told me that it had been done by a bullet at Duck Lake, which had felled him stunned to the ground. It was a close call, end quote. Dumas knew that more soldiers were coming under the command of General Frederick Middleton. Knowing he likely wouldn't win on an open battlefield, Dumas organized his men into a guerrilla campaign that targeted the soldiers and railroads. Unfortunately, this plan was ruled down by the provisional government, with Rial hoping for a peaceful resolution. As the resistance went on, Dumas would discover traitors among the Métis who were looking to kill Rial. Dumas would apparently jump in front of Rial when Alexander Monkman went to shoot him. Dumas was not hurt and Monkman was arrested. On April 24, 1885, Dumont and his Métis met the Canadians at Fish Creek, winning a stunning victory causing Middleton to briefly pause his march to Batoche. The Métis were outnumbered 5-1, to one, but Dumont's leadership allowed them to drive off the attackers and begin their retreat to Batoche. General Middleton would write following the battle to the War Department weeks later, quote, I find from the papers captured at Batoche yesterday that the number of rebels at Fish Creek was 280 under Gabriel Dumont. That they had intended to let me enter the ravine or crest and then destroy us, taking me prisoner and holding me as a hostage to assist them in making terms with the government at Ottawa. Their scheme was defeated by my having my scouts so far in advance, which obliged them to fire on them and thus disclose their position. End quote. Middleton would state that the bullet that shot through his hat on the battlefield came from Dumas, although there's nothing to confirm this as fact. Dr. Charles Mulvaney would write of seeing Dumas in battle, quote, Dumas was not seen during the fight, but one of our scouts saw him riding off after it was over. His directing hand was plainly see, however, as nobody else on Riel's side could have arranged the rebel plans or picked the ground so well. The rebel movements appeared to be directed by long, low whistles. Occasionally, they could be heard shouting to each other, Keep back, go on, this way, fire lower. But during the serious part of the day, they fought in grim silence. End quote. From May 9th to 12, 1885, Dumas would lead the four-day defense at Batoche as the Canadians closed in. And while the Canadians outnumbered the Métis defenders, Dumas was still able to incapacitate a military river steamer and repel the Canadians several times. By the fourth day, though, the Métis were out of ammunition and resorted to shooting nails and scrap metal. Batoche was soon captured and Dumas went into hiding in the area. For the next several days, he would distribute blankets to Métis women and children as he ensured their safety. When Dumas found out that Rial was in custody, he left for the United States. 
As a wanted man in Canada, there were rumors that Dumas was going to mount a rescue mission of Rial from Regina, but this obviously proved to be untrue. When Dumas did arrive in the United States, he was arrested, but a communication from the Oval Office itself ordered his release. Knowing that he was in the United States, the Canadian government did not attempt to get him extradited to Canada. But the Canadian government did put a bounty of $5,000 briefly on his head, but this would eventually be removed. There were rumors that Dumas was attempting to launch another rebellion, but Dumas would deny these rumors in a letter to the Montreal Gazette. Writing from Montana, he would state that his only occupation now was to provide for the wants of his family. Then, in July 1886, Dumas was given amnesty, but he did not return to Canada quite yet. Many claimed that he had taken amnesty just for himself, but he would always state that he never sought amnesty and he wanted amnesty for everyone involved in the resistance. During his time in the United States, he would briefly work with the Buffalo Bill Cody's Wild West show where he was promoted as a rebel leader. He would tour with the company even riding in a parade down New York's Fifth Avenue and competing against the legendary Annie Oakley as a marksman. The Montreal Gazette would report, quote, A fiction is going in the rounds of the press which does credit to the inventive genius of the author. It is to the effect that Mr. Gabe Rial, brother of the leader of the half-breed insurrection who is now performing in London with Buffalo Bill's Wild West show, threatens to organize another rebellion to avenge his brother's death. Indeed, concern will give place to amusement when it is learned that Gabriel is none other than Gabriel Dumas, who has been doing the cowboy act with Buffalo Bill for several months past at $10 a week and board. End quote. And I apologize for that racial word in the quote, but unfortunately there's going to be a few more of those coming up. On Staten Island, as he posed with tourists, a reporter would write, quote, Gabriel Dumas, the only political exile in America, studied the big crowds more than they studied him. End quote. He spent the next several years traveling around the United States before arriving in Montreal in 1888, and he would do various speaking tours at this time in Canada, but they did not sell well. The Ottawa Journal reported, quote, Gabriel Dumas lectured to a very small audience in the Academy of Music last night on the cause and incidents in connection with the Northwest Rebellion. End quote. While in Montreal, there was oddly an effort put forward to induce him to marry a rich widow, despite already being married. Dumas would politely refuse. Dumas would return to Batoche in April of 1889, four years after the resistance. There, he stated he had seen great changes since he left. Many houses had been demolished, and while there were new homes, he said that it was more desolate than when he left. Not all news of Dumas' return was favorable. The Victoria Daily Times reported, and again, I apologize for the language, stating, quote, The rebel leader, Dumas, having returned to the old stamping ground, Duck Lake, talks defiantly and in very bad taste for a third-rate revolutionist. The Northwest Rebellion had its rise in cause. If rebellion is justifiable, the half-breeds were justified in resorting to force to obtain recognition of their claims. Riel surrendered himself like a fawning hound, when if he had sought a soldier's grave, his enemies would have admired him. Nor was Dumas much better than his leader. He thought more of his skin than he did of his grievances. And yet now this man, who would have been a soldier only for his vile guns, is sowing the seeds of discontent among his former followers by seditious brag. Quote. In 1893, Dumas set up his permanent home in Batoche, and he would dictate a two-volume memoir of the Northwest Resistance. His 103-page manuscript, dictated to friends, remained unseen and unpublished in the Manitoba Provincial Archives until 1971. It was rediscovered at this point and translated in English and published as Gabriel Dumas Speaks in 2009. In May of 1906, Dumas began to complain of pains in his chest and arms as he was on a hunting trip. On May 19, 1906, he would go for his usual walk and then asked for a bowl of soup. He took a few mouthfuls, walked over to his bed and fell over dead. It was revealed later he had died of heart failure. Interestingly, Riel's mother died the exact same day as Dumas, but Dumas had lived long enough to see Saskatchewan become a province within Canada. The Montreal Gazette would report on his funeral, and I apologize for the language here, stating, quote, His funeral was largely attended by half-breeds and Indians, who in life worshipped the daring, courageous, and resourceful old man who led them in the hunt as well as on the field of battle. End quote. Dumas would be buried at Batoche, where the Northwest Resistance came to an end in 1885. 
After the Northwest resistance, Dumas fared better than Rial in the public opinion. While Rial was vilified by many, Dumas was remembered with much more fondness. For many, due to his life as a bison hunter, he captured the romantic imagination of the time. He was also seen as the one who best represented Métis culture as a fighter and warrior, driven by a concern for the welfare of his people. He has been honoured extensively in the Canadian prairies, including at the Gabriel Dumas Institution of Native Studies and Applied Research. Gabriel Bridge near Rossler in Saskatchewan is named for Dumas, as is a French first language high school in London, Ontario. In 1981, Dumas was made a National Historic Person. I hope you enjoyed that episode and my look at Gabriel Dumas. Next week, we have my favorite kind of episode, a nostalgia episode, and I'm looking at the iconic television show, The Red Green Show. And I'm going to be having an interview in that episode with Steve Smith, Red Green himself. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. And you can donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Katie Caldwell, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, an anonymous patron that I truly do appreciate, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Rawa, Luke S., J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Information from Canadian Encyclopedia, Maclean's Biography, The Edmonton Bolton, Wikipedia, The Winnipeg Tribune, Montreal Gazette, Manitoba Free Press, Virtual Saskatchewan, National Arts Centre, Lurial Institute, and The Ottawa Journal. Thanks. We'll see you again next time.